there is a rising wave of what I call critics from within the church. You've got the critics from without, like Richard Dawkins and other new atheists, but you have critics from within who are basically agreeing with the descriptions Hmm. of the new atheists saying, you know, the God of the Old Testament uh, is, uh, you know, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, and so forth, uh, you know, and a vindictive bully. Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we identify the core claims of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And today, we're asking the question, is God a vindictive bully? So some seem to think that the God that we read about in the Old Testament behaves differently than he does in the New. So we're going to talk through some specific passages surrounding the Canaanite conquest, instructions for Israel. Israel regarding prisoners of war and women. We'll also talk about that pesky passage in 2 Kings in which bears mauled 42 young people after they made fun of Elisha for having a bald head. So stay tuned for that. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure and subscribe to the Unshaken Faith podcast. If you haven't heard about this, this is a brand new podcast that I've started with my good friend Natasha Crane, where we have weekly 15-minute-ish episodes on kind of hot button cultural topics, and our hope is to help you live your Christian faith boldly in a chaotic culture. So last week, we talked about the He Gets Us campaign and just maybe some things to be aware of about it, maybe some concerns to be thinking through. And also, go to unshakenconference.com to find out more information about the conference that Natasha and I have started called the Unshaken Conference. We're going to be in Dayton, Ohio this weekend. So if you're anywhere in the Dayton, Cincinnati area, be sure and get their tickets are selling fast, so go to unshakenconference.com. We're going to be joined by our good friend Frank Turek. And again, just our goal is to help you live your Christian faith boldly in a chaotic culture. So check those things out. And without any further ado, I want to introduce my guest today. Uh, this is someone who really was instrumental in helping me when my faith was in crisis, helping me rebuild and interact with some really skeptical claims that people were bringing against the Bible in specific specifically the Old Testament. He's been on the podcast before, but it's been a while. So uh, Dr. Paul Copan is a Christian theologian, analytic philosopher, apologist, and author. He is currently a professor at uh, the Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida and holds the endowed Pledger Family Chair of Philosophy and Ethics. And over there at PBA, they have a Master of Arts in Philosophy of Religion. So if you're interested in studying there, um, we'll put a link in the comments so you can uh, find out more information about that. But Paul, welcome. I'm, I'm so honored that you would join me today. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. Great to be with you, Lisa, and uh, appreciate what you're doing. Oh, thanks. Well, I, I told you this before, but I think your work is just invaluable for the church. And I, I think your willingness to write and speak about difficult topics as they relate to the Old Testament and the nature of God is just something I, I wish more people would be doing. Um, but why don't you start by telling us why you chose to write this new book, which, by the way, I forgot to tell people about. It's called Is God a Vindictive Bully? This has just come out. Um, it's sort of uh, a companion to your previous book called Is God a Moral Monster, which I recommend all the time to people. So why did you decide to write this kind of uh, companion? I don't know if you would call it an update or what you would call it, but uh, Is God a Vindictive Bully? Sure. Yeah, well, I it, it all started out by my writing an article for Philosophia Christi, the Journal of the Evangelical Philo Philosophical Society, called Is Yahweh a Moral Monster in response to the New Atheists. And I used a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the uh, slogans and uh, descriptions of the new atheists uh, about the Old Testament God to, uh, you know, they were my chapter headings. And so I turned that, you know, that, of course, you know, that, well, that article eventually became this book with those chapter headings. And then uh, that led to a, a further book on, uh, did God really command genocide? And then with a lot of the interaction that I've gotten, you're right, uh, not a lot of people are speaking about these issues. Uh, when I'm asked to speak, I'd say probably about 75% of the time, I'm speaking on these difficult Old Testament ethical challenges. And, and when my book came out, uh, my Moral Monster book came out in 2011, it really seemed to hit uh, a, a, 
a nerve and met a need, uh, as, as you have uh, described to me, a lot of people wrestling with some of the difficulties in the Old Testament. And, uh, and, and what has since uh, transpired is that there is a rising wave of what I call critics from within the church. You've got the critics from without, like Richard Dawkins and other new atheists, but you have critics from within who are saying, basically agreeing with the descriptions hmm. of the new atheists saying, yeah, God is, you know, the God of the Old Testament uh, is, uh, you know, genocidal, philicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, and so forth, uh, you know, and a vindictive bully. Uh, my book titles come from Richard Dawkins. Uh, hmm. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. And uh, And what I'm trying to do is push back on some of the claims by Greg Boyd, um, Peter Enns, uh, Eric uh, Seibert, um, you know, Randall Rouser even, uh, to, you know, that these critics from within who, and I'd say primarily Greg Boyd, uh, whose book came out in 2017, 1400 pages, uh, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, in which he distinguishes, following Eric Seibert, distinguishes between the textual God and the actual God. The textual God is the fictional understanding of God by the Old Testament prophet or narrator, uh, so that when it says, thus says the Lord, drive out the Canaanites or whatever, that's not the actual God. That's the textual God of this fallen, violence-prone author or prophet. The actual God uh, is the one who is represented in Jesus Christ, who says, Father, forgive them that don't know what they're doing, turn the other cheek, etc. And what I try to show is that where the attempts to differentiate between the textual God and the actual God by Greg Boyd, uh, over and over again, the New Testament un undermines or refutes what Greg Boyd is saying, that, and what I try to show is that in those instances where he makes these distinctions, the New Testament and other uh, texts from the Old Testament point out that, no, these, the textual God and the actual God are identical. And so, and as I was reading Greg Boyd's book, The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, uh, I, would, I would go through, I'd say, what does he do with this text? What does he do with that text? I checked the index. Nope, not there, not there, mm, not mm -hmm. there, not there, not there. Dozens of times, just wasn't finding them. And so I find it's a, it's a highly selective treatment of the biblical text and that there are some New Testament texts that I think would are, are just damning for Greg Boyd and, uh, and, and those who take that view. And what I try to show is that, uh, you know, my, a theme verse that I use is Romans 11, 22. Behold then the kindness and severity mm -hmm. of God. This is the New Testament. This is the Apostle right. Paul. Although Greg Boyd isn't afraid to go after the Apostle Paul and say, oh, Paul, Paul was being vengeful here in this text and, and so forth. So, so Greg Boyd is, is kind of the, you know, is, is making these pronouncements about Paul, who certainly knows uh, of what it means to preach the cross of Christ, but yet it has wrathful implications and that God is indeed severe uh, in, uh, you know, through Jesus Christ. And, and we could talk about some of those texts or whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. But oh, that's so kind many, of a, a so brief many places I want to go right now because this is so good. Um, but just to give our listeners kind of um, an idea of uh, just in, in the practical sense of what you're talking about, you mentioned Pete Enns, and uh, from his book, the Bible tells me so. This is just an example of what you're talking about. He says the Bible is an ancient book, and we shouldn't be surprised to see it act like one. So seeing God portrayed as a violent tribal warrior is not how God is, but how He was understood to be by the ancient Israelites communing with God in their time and place. And so we see this a lot in more progressive Christian movements where uh, this the textual God versus the actual God really plays out in their entire approach to the Bible. Uh, there's, in fact, Richard Rohr has a quote from, I believe it's his book, The Divine Dance, where he basically says, just interpret the Bible the way Jesus did. Jesus, in this, according to Rohr, Jesus denied, opposed, um, or ignored any passages of scripture that were punitive, tribalistic, or imperialistic. And then he gives a few examples, and um, I actually ended up writing a research paper on all the examples, just going through, like, is this really what Jesus was doing? And it really wasn't what Jesus was doing. He was never right. denying or ignoring or opposing the scriptures. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I think we see this a lot in the progressive Christian movement. Of course, you mentioned Boyd, who does mm -hmm. not consider himself to be a progressive Christian. However, he's an important figure because 
his hermeneutic influences so many in the progressive Christian movement. And I remember mm-hmm. watching a debate between you and Boyd, or listening to one, rather, and you pointed that out, the point you mm-hmm. just made, that there were a lot of verses that he just doesn't engage with, um, you know, even New Testament verses that that demonstrate the severity of God and, and Jesus mm-hmm. sort of living that out. Um, mm-hmm. So let's do this. Let's, um, you sort of, let's back up a little bit because you mentioned how the critics from within, as you call them, are sort of agreeing with what the new atheists were saying. That was something that really stood out to me when I started engaging with the movement of progressive Christianity. In fact, when I started writing about progressive Christianity, I didn't think anybody would care because it was really all the same stuff that apologists were interacting with coming from atheists, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but let's talk about, there's an ancient heresy. I've written a little bit about it called, um, and I may pronounce this wrong, my understanding is that Martianism is that how Marcian, you pronounce it? Mar- Marcian, Marcianism. Marcianism. Yeah. Okay. Not Martianism like little green men, but Marcianism, <laughs> uh, a.k.a. Marcian, who um, this goes back to the early second century. Now, uh, obviously, I don't think many progressives today are taking it quite as far as maybe Marcian did, but talk about Marcianism and maybe how we see mm-hmm. that reflected in some of this scholarship that is being written by the critics with, with, within, so to speak. Yeah. Well, Marcion uh, differentiated between the harsh, severe God of the Old Testament, uh, the Judaic God, and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're talking about two gods. And so he developed a a canon of scripture that excluded those Judaic and severe elements uh, as holy scripture and came up with his own canon. Now, uh, the people who are who identify themselves as you know like well greg boyd and peter ends and others they they would repudiate the marcionite uh association uh tremper longman for example does refer to them as practical marcionites that they are in in practice undermining the authority uh, of the old testament where it should be taken as god's true revelation they would undermine it as uh, you know, they would say that it's false, or Greg Boyd would say it's basically God allowing these textual God misrepresentations by these ancient prophets and narrators that, that you know, he's portrayed as violent and vengeful and so forth. But, but basically, God is allowing himself to be misrepresented. And when you see Jesus on the cross, it's as though God is peeling away or tearing off that mask that uh, kept hidden that revelation that you get glimpses of in the Old Testament, but you see clearly revealed when G- with Jesus on the cross, what Greg Boyd calls cruciformity. And one of the so so I, I don't you I don't say well Greg Boyd is a Marcionite, but I do think that there are certain trajectories that are troubling, and that the sorts of things that Greg Boyd is saying. I was, I was talking with a, an Old Testament professor uh, um, who's you know who is also a pacifist, was critical of, is critical of Greg Boyd, not because, you know, Greg Boyd's a pacifist, this, uh, you know, Old Testament scholar's a pacifist, but he sees the Old Testament as having, again, there, there is severity, there is judgment, there is, uh, there is uh, warfare that God commands. So he's not shrinking from those, but he's saying that God is now working in a different way. And by, when Greg Boyd is undermining this revelation of God, that God is commanding, the driving out of the Canaanites and so forth, he sees this as kind of unsettling the foundations of the authority of the Old Testament. And, and Greg Boyd pushes things further by, uh, so we do have, in a sense, a two God model, the textual God and the actual God. But Greg Boyd, in his treatment of the Sermon on the Mount, which is, uh, I find, really problematic, when you know, when Greg Boyd, he's saying, well, Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and, and, and he is repudiating the law of Moses, he's doing no such thing. Right. Uh, Moses is upheld. You know, he in Matthew twenty-three, uh, you those who are sitting the seat of Moses. Uh, you know, he says, "Listen to what they say, but don't do what they do." He's not saying, right. "Don't listen to that." That's Moses. No, uh, Moses is upheld as a someone who is faithful in all of God's household. Greg Boyd says that what is what looks like faithfulness and and courage for God in the Old Testament can be seen as something demonic in the new. Mm. 
You don't see that in the New Testament. You don't see the New Testament writers or Jesus himself speaking about Moses in that way. That is a misrepresentation. So he, uh, Greg Boyd is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say to you, Jesus is repudiating it. No, Jesus is repudiating a false representation. Mm-hmm. of the Old That's Testament right. yeah. that, say, justifies personal vengeance, which is something that should be in a legal setting. You're applying it personally, saying eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. I'm going to get you back for that, uh, and so forth. On down the list, I, I go point for point to say, no, Jesus is not repudiated. He, repudiating this. He's repudiating a false representation of Moses. Greg Boyd wants to create a wide gap between mm-hmm. Moses and Jesus. And it's not to say that there isn't, you know, of course, food laws, circumcision, so forth. There's a, you know, there's a new people of God who are from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. It's no longer the nation of Israel. But that doesn't mean that the Old Testament is being dismissed uh, or undermined. Uh, in fact, what we want to do is, Greg Boyd says, we should look at some of those early interpreters, like the allegorizers, like Origen and so forth, who see Joshua uh, as, as kind of a, a, a battle against uh, you know, uh, uh, spiritual forces and becoming uh, victorious over the flesh and so forth. Well, the New Testament writers don't see it that way. Uh, what we ought to do is try to imitate as best we can what the hermeneutic or approach to the Old Testament is by those New Testament authorities. And so we don't see them allegorizing those texts in that way. We see over and over again, Acts 7, Acts 13, uh, James chapter 1, Hebrews 11, those warfare texts, those battles, these are not seen as something that is rejected by God, but this is part of God's unfolding purposes in giving the land to the Israelites. And so I, I call out Greg Boyd for misusing certain texts like Nehemiah 9 that God basically just said, okay, do what you want. You can act violently and go into the land, uh, but you're, you're just misrepresenting my message uh, of wanting to peacefully bring the people into the land and peacefully removing the Canaanites from the land and so forth. Uh, you know, and, and so I, I, I call out Greg Boyd that he is seeing this as negative, that you can do with them what you want. And this is actually saying, no, God gave them the land. The, the, and I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here. You just look up the passage Nehemiah 9, where Greg Boyd is saying, you know, when God said, do as you please with them, uh, that, that this God is basically just turning them over to their own evil desires. But the negative stuff actually comes later on in the text. Mm-hmm. But they, you know, God brought them into this land and gave them this beautiful land. But they forsook him. They abandoned him. They didn't listen to his voice and so forth. That negative stuff comes later, not in that text when God says, and, and, and they, you know, to, to do as you please, uh, you know, that, yeah, anyway, I, I don't want to get yeah. into too much detail, but, but point for point, Greg Boyd is misrepresenting things. In fact, he doesn't even define what violence is. I remember he said, that. Yeah. I, and, you know, here is this book challenging Old Testament violence. And I asked him, I said, Greg, why, why don't you even give us a definition of violence? He says, well, basically when you see it, you know it. And <laughs> well, Greg Boyd would see the policeman, maybe a, a Christian cop who is trying to defend uh, someone's life and maybe have to, has to use lethal, lethal force to do so. Greg Boyd would say, well, that is violence. That person shouldn't be a cop. I would say, well, no, that person is actually loving his neighbor and caring for those who cannot protect themselves. This is a good thing, uh, just policing and so on. I don't see, you know, I don't see that as the illegitimate use of force. I think it's a legitimate use of force. But Greg Boyd would say that's violence. So we right. disagree with that very basic issue. But Greg Boyd doesn't even give to us uh, a definition of it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned uh, something that is a very common sentiment expressed in the movement of progressive Christianity, which is the idea that when Jesus uh, said, you've heard it said, but I say at the on the Sermon on the Mount that he was, you know, disagreeing with the Old Testament or he was making a brand new way. I've heard that expressed many times. In fact, the example I gave about Richard <clears throat> Rohr's hermeneutic saying, you know, interpret the Bible with the way Jesus did. He ignored, denied, opposed. The examples that he gave, many of them were from the Sermon on the Mount where he used those. So I, I'm familiar with all those examples because I went into each one and just you realize that even there are times when Jesus isn't actually, when he says, you've heard it said, He's not actually talking about the Old Testament, but he's talking about the traditions that the Pharisees were adding to the the Old Testament and things like that. Um, And I would just add, too, mm -hmm. that in chapter 4 of Matthew, just before you get the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, it is written, it is written, it is written, quoting from the law of Moses. That's right. Uh, So he's not distancing himself from Moses there. And we could could also add that there is a a lot more that is going on here and that Jesus is doing some things that are very severe— in the New Testament. And uh, and so we can, like in Jude 5, I'll, I'll just kind of give a couple of examples here where 
Jesus uh, is, is, our best manuscripts in Jude 5 say Jesus, Christological reading of the Old Testament, Jesus, after he had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, destroyed those who did not believe. <sighs> Jesus is engaged in judging the Israelites, bringing death to them, say the, yeah. the serpent plague and so forth. Uh, or in, in red letters in the book of, Reve <clears throat> excuse me, the book of Revelation, uh, it says that, you know, Jesus is, is talking about this false prophetess Jezebel, and he says he's going to cast her on a bed of sickness and strike dead her followers. This is a temporal judgment. Uh, so again, very severe. Jesus talks about those who mislead his little ones, uh, his disciples. And he said, it'd be better to have a millstone hung around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Again, very severe judgment. Uh, so we can we can go on and add these sorts of things. We talk about the book of Acts. Greg Boyd says, Ananias, Sapphira, they were Maybe Peter was misusing divine, you know, his divine authority, divine power to strike them dead. Or maybe this was, uh, they had died of a heart attack right there co conveniently, or that some demonic powers struck them dead. But you read in the book of Acts, the hand of the Lord in chapter 11 was with them. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. That same hand of the Lord in chapter 13 strikes Elamas blind. In chapter 12, right in between, we see that the angel of the Lord delivers Peter from prison. But at the end of that chapter, the hand of the Lord strikes down Herod for boasting uh, mm -hmm. you know, and taking credit as, as God. So even the book of Acts, you see the kindness and the severity of God played out, uh, just like Paul says in Romans eleven twenty two. Yeah. Uh, okay, quick question, because I do want to get to some of these specific passages, um, but... I, have you have you ever has anyone ever brought up the point and I'm sure they have but my understanding is that that passage where Jesus says father forgive them for they know not what they do is actually a textual variant and um it it seems kind of interesting that Boyd would formulate his entire her hermeneutic around a textual variant right is is that is that fair to say or yeah, well, I think my major point is, and it doesn't mean, you know, Jesus does say in the Sermon on the Mount, um, you know, love your enemies, do good to them that persecute you and so forth. So, I mean, the point is still there. Right. So even, you know, but but again, the cruciformity, of course, Jesus dying for his enemies that he, when he was, if First Peter chapter two, when Jesus was reviled, he didn't revile in, in return, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. We see that there is that demeanor of, free, of of enemy love that God, you know, while we were enemies at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans five tells us. So, so there is that theme there, and I don't want to diminish it, uh, but I do think that what Greg Boyd is doing is taking a very narrow slice of the ministry of Jesus, the the uh, the words of Jesus, and being very reductionistic, reducing it all to that, and anything that is a variation. Oh, that's got that opposes what what cruciformity is. Therefore, we've got to throw it out or or call it the textual God. And I think this is a this is an imbalanced way of looking at the text, where we do see divine severity. Greg Boyd wants to play down the driving out of the money changers from the temple, uh, but Jesus is utilizing coercive force to drive out money changers. Uh, you know, he, Greg Boyd says, well, there were no animals hurt in the making of this pericope, but, mm -hmm. uh, but he is basically, uh, you know, Jesus is acting in a way that doesn't look like father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, and then you look at the rest of the new Testament, Jesus is involved in the judgment against the Israelites, Jude five, Jesus is, uh, you know, he is going to be striking down Jezebel's followers, uh, again, a temporal judgment that means death. And so we have, you know, Greg Boyd, but he'll, he'll say, well, you know, that's metaphorical in the, in the book of Revelation. Well, metaphor doesn't reduce the severity or the terror of the wrath of the lamb. As we see in Revelation six, people are crying for the rocks to fall upon them because of the wrath of the lamb. That doesn't sound like father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We see that there is terror. And even if it's metaphorical, the terror is still very real, uh, that we still see the severity of God played out very prominently. And so there are just a number of texts that Greg Boyd mishandles or ignores. And, uh, it, you know, it, it's it, a friend of mine, Robertson McCulkin says, has said that, uh, that it's always easier to go to a consistent extreme than to stay at the center of biblical tension. And what I see Greg Boyd doing is trying to go to a consistent extreme, but ignoring a lot of other texts. And, and even if it means keeping things in tension, I want to be there where that tension is yeah. and try to hold these things together rather than uh, to to break them apart. Uh, what God is 
join together, at least as keeping intention, let not uh, Greg Boyd separate. And so mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to, uh, to highlight in, in what I'm doing in my, in my Vindictive Bully project. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm actually looking this up right now because I could be wrong about this, but even when we talk about the Canaanite conquest, which is, you know, it's very difficult for a lot of people to, to process what went on during that. But isn't there, because you were mentioning how uh, the verse, I think it was from Hebrews, where Jesus is credited with, you know, the judgment of the Israelites. But isn't there, and I'm looking for it, but there's a scene in which right before they go into uh, Jericho, they mm -hmm. uh he meets the army or the the commander of the army of the lord yeah the, i mean and so you know is that a christophany is that jesus and if so didn't jesus lead that charge well i think it's important first of all even apart from that text to say jesus the son of god is involved in all of the unfolding of yes. the old testament revelation that he you know, the father son and spirit are involved in the unfolding of biblical, the biblical story, that this is not something that, oh, Jesus just kind of shows up on the scene in the New Testament and, uh, and that, that he disagrees with what's going on in the Old Testament. No, he is fundamentally involved in the workings of Israel in, in both uh, creation, in, in uh, redemption, uh, as well as bringing judgment. So we ought to see this as a coherent whole. Uh, mm. Isaiah saw Jesus, John 12 tells us, you know, at, you know saw his glory and, and, and proclaimed it. Uh, you know, again, referring to Isaiah chapter six, Jesus seeing the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. Uh, the, in first Corinthians chapter 10, uh, you know, that rock was Christ. So there is a this Christological reading of of going through the Old Testament, and again that that chapter ten refers to all of these judgments that fall against the Israelites for grumbling, for sexual immorality, for idolatry, and so forth. And it and and Jesus is the one who is with with the Israelites mm -hmm. going through the wilderness. And Jude five confirms that that Jesus destroyed those who did not believe. So I think it's important to see it have a, a Trinitarian understanding of God's dealings in the Old Testament rather than seeing Jesus as a latecomer and, uh, and he just shows up and shows the, the kindness of God and, and not the severity. No, we see yeah. Jesus is involved in both. And I think it's helpful to understand that, yes, that God is both light and God is love, First John tells us. Uh, but I also, I think there's an angle on the wrath of God that is important to see that yeah. wrath can often be seen as coming from the love of God, that be, when people are being dehumanized, when people are being uh, treated oppressively, uh, God is angry because he is concerned about the uh, harm that is coming to his image bearers. So, uh, and, and as some theologians note, that God is, you know, N.T. Wright and Miroslav Volf, that God is wrathful because he is love, that, that, that it springs from his passionate concern. There's also justice too, I don't deny that. Yeah. But I think there's also love being expressed here that we ought not to pit wrath against love. And, but see, see often times that love is coming, is expressing itself just like a jealous, you know, spouse when someone, right. when a third party is interfering in the marriage relationship. Yeah, it would actually be right to be righteously angry about mm -hmm. the types of sins that d hurt people and harm people. And uh, for some reason, we give ourselves that grace, but we have trouble with it when it comes to God. Well, maybe because, you know, apart from Christ, that wrath would be aimed at us as well. And this mm. is just a little teaser for our listeners. Uh, we are going to be doing an entire episode on wrath with Joshua Ryan Butler coming soon. So be uh, tuned in for that. Um, so Paul, it's, you know, you've got your work cut out for you talking about this difficult stuff, especially right now, because we live in a meme culture, a TikTok culture. Mm -hmm. The attention span of the average person is very short. And right. given that, uh, plus just the heaps of information that, and, and not all accurate information, by the way, that's available, um, all it takes really is somebody making a one minute TikTok uh, about some difficult passage in the Old Testament. And for many people, they just consume that info, move on to the next thing without really thinking it through or even trying to approach the problem from a place of fair mindedness, understanding mm -hmm. or thoughtful analysis. And so I want to give you the opportunity to lay the groundwork as far as 
how we approach the Old Testament. So it was written thousands of years ago. It's uh, written in the context of a culture that's very ancient and different than ours. So let's talk about that cultural context. Um, sometimes people are rattled when they find out, well, the Mosaic law wasn't the only law code around. And there are mm -hmm. there were many other ancient law codes. I have a book uh, in my library that has uh, just, you know, Old Testament, uh, not, I'm sorry, not Old Testament, um, Eco uh, out, outside cultures, like pagan cultures, their their scriptures and their uh, creation narratives and, and even their law codes and things. Um, and I remember being really challenged by that the first time I heard about that. So can you comment on what it looked like to be an Israelite in that time and place and who were the people around them? What were their law codes like and how was that yeah. different from uh, the law codes that God gave to Moses? Yeah. Well, a couple of things might be helpful here. Uh, keep in mind that we're, you know, we're told, of course, in, in, uh, you know, in, in the book of Acts that, uh, uh, you know, in Acts 7, that Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. And so he knew all of these law codes, these uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, creation and flood stories, etc. Uh, what Moses is doing is he is bringing a monotheistic understanding to these things and also correcting some of those uh, misrepresentations like the gods being lazy and so creating human beings to do their you know, digging of irrigation canals and so forth. Uh, and and so, so there is a, a monotheistic theistic understanding here that is brought to bear on these uh, these ancient stories and 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 putting them into a correct theological light uh, secondly when it comes to these law codes as you it, there's no problem with saying Moses utilized something from you know, a, a text or a portion from the Code of Hammurabi or some other uh, you know Hittite law or something like that. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of like the Book of Proverbs. Proverbs right. draws from ancient Egyptian proverbs, and so we have you know, so there's no this all wisdom, all truth is God's truth, and so if you uh, are are putting together a law book, you you might quote some things that are familiar to the people uh, that don't contradict uh, the, the character of God, or at least where God wants his people to be, uh, during this phase of their, their existence, uh, and, and setting the tone for where they're to go. So there, there may be parallels, but one of the things that I point out thirdly is that the, as you look at the worldview assumption of the law of Moses compared to the other, to the worldview assumptions of these other ancient Near Eastern law codes, they are worlds apart in terms of one, treat how you treat the foreigner in your midst, uh, how you treat people in your society. Do you have a hierarchical understanding of a society or is it a democratized understanding as within Israel? Uh, if, you, if you have been a foreigner in the land of Egypt and have found freedom, then there are word, foreign runaway slaves who come to Israel can find refuge there, uh, that you are to look out for the orphan, for the widow, the alien uh, in your midst. Basically, the law of Moses is telling you, look out for the most vulnerable people in your society. Do not take advantage of them because mm -hmm. you were once taken advantage of in the land of Israel. So Israel's narrative itself gives shape to a certain ethic that is worlds apart from other ancient Near Eastern cultures. And I, and I talk about this with regard to how you treat the poor, uh, to in terms of uh, money that is given to the poor, that you're not to gouge the poor with heavy interest loans and so forth. So I go through a, a couple of chapters in which I note these worldview differences that are taking place there. So you can say, oh, this is parallel to that. Well, that's interesting. And, but there's no problem. I mean, you'll see Paul quoting from pagan, uh, pagan right. writers in, in Acts 17. Yeah. So again, all truth is God's truth. There's no re need to reinvent the wheel. But what is important is to look at these significant worldview differences between Israel's law and that of the surrounding nations. And you see that the, those differences really pop. And I try to point that out in the book. Mm -hmm. and, and to your point, even I've got a blog post on this, and I think I even put a, a bit of this in one of my books too, because it was one of the early challenges that I had to walk through too, is somebody pointing out that the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, there are iterations of that. And I actually looked each one of them up in the original text and everything. And you know, you do find uh, ideas like that prior to Jesus, like uh, don't do to other people what you wouldn't want them to do to mm -hmm. you, I think is some, something similar to what even Confucius said. And it's interesting right. to me even that, you know, whether Jesus was aware of, you know, in his humanity of 
Confucius or not would not really matter because he's speaking mm-hmm. truth, but also he's actually making it more harder, more, I mean, more difficult mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. do. Because according to most of the other ways it's iterated, it's just, you know, you don't really have to do anything. Just don't do to other people what you mm-hmm. don't want them to do to you. And yet Jesus says, you know, you have to actually go and do to other people. So it's an active yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, there's, there's, yeah. Uh, I remember being a little bit rattled by that when yeah. I, especially mm-hmm. with the Proverbs, when you read some of those, uh, pro, you know, Proverbs that are very, very similar to what we have in the Bible. Um, But there's Mm -hmm. also, you know, we know that the law of God is written on our hearts. And Mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be that surprising for people to figure out long before our scripture was written that it's good to be good to one another or that it's, you know, things like that. So I think that's a, that's a good point you bring up. Um, So, you know, let me just jump in with, and just say this too, that Jesus himself, a lot of people say, oh, Jesus came up with this enemy love thing. No, it's in the old Testament. Uh, And so we can add that too, that Jesus was being innovative here, cutting edge. Uh, (laughs) No, you know, we see in Acts, in Exodus 23, that if your enemy's ox is trapped, uh, you know, help, your enemies, you know, help, help that ox get out of the, you right. know, and so you're showing love to your enemy or even Proverbs 25, where, you know, if your enemy is hungry, uh, feed him. If he's thirsty, get him to drink. You see enemy love, even the Old Testament. So Jesus isn't saying, the Old Testament said, hate your enemies. I'm saying love your enemies. No, that's a misrepresentation of what's going on. Right, right. That's good. That's a good distinction. So, uh, you know, one of the, the claims I see a lot on TikTok, I, you know, I mentioned to you before we went on the air that I've just spent the last year you're really intensely researching deconstruction. And so a lot of that is manifesting on TikTok and Instagram with short little videos. And one of the things I see continually said, and uh, this is among deconstructed people, whether they're progressive Christians or they've just, you know, completely left the faith altogether, um, they'll, they'll reference Deuteronomy 22, 28, and 29. And they'll say, hey, you know, your Old Testament God, you like to point out all the good stuff, like, you know, help the guy out with his ox and all that. But it would, you know, they'll claim that it was really oppressive to women because according to the deconstructionists in Deuteronomy 22, if a woman is raped, then she has to marry her rapist. And that's often framed that way. Um, but there, there's a little bit more going on in that passage, isn't there? Would you would you want to comment on Like, I can... Uh, I can read to uh, to you. It says, if a man, this is for our listeners who may not be familiar. Um, So Deuteronomy 22, 28 through 29 says, if a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her and they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, this is a, this is a picture of not rape, but seduction. And, uh, and I talk about this in the, in the Moral Monster book, that there is, you have instances of, you know, concrete distinctions between, say, adultery, uh, as well as rape, uh, but thirdly, seduction. And we could, you know, and, and so when you have seduction, you have someone who is uh, led into this by someone who is, you know, perhaps in a position of authority or whatever, but the or has greater status in 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 society than than the young woman does. But still, there is the question: she may still want to be with this person, uh, and and of course there's and so that that seducer uh, may end up being willing to, you know, she may actually be attracted to that person like him and and, and, and but th- so that that is the sort of thing that is to be decided between you know with the, along with the father and and, uh, and and making this arrangement uh and and keep in mind too that if if she is you know deflowered this is a liability for her in that society and so yeah. there is a certain responsibility that comes for with the you know for the on the part of the seducer to to take responsibility for what he has done rather than just uh treating uh treating her as uh as you know used goods as it were mm-hmm. uh you know as some you know, as sometimes you know, as we see in in many days in in say muslim cultures etc that there is that kind of ethos that is that is there as well someone is no longer valued because she has been you know there's been a sexual relationship so so there are there are those considerations so there are distinctions that i'd point out and uh, I would refer people, I uh, kind of sense I touch on this in the in the vindictive bully book, but point beyond to the the moral monster book where I, I bring clarity to that issue. 
Right. And then it's it's kind of stated similarly in Exodus 22, 16 and 17, where it's kind of more to the point you're making. And it actually says, if a man seduces a virgin mm-hmm. who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make mm-hmm. her his wife. Mm-hmm. If her father mm-hmm. utterly refuses to give her to him, mm-hmm. he shall pay money equal to the bride price right. for virgins. So she actually didn't yeah. have to marry him. That would be right, kind exactly. of something that, um, you know, you kind of, you have to take everything all together. And also, I think people and, lose and that, track. Me, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and just in that Deuteronomy passage too, it says, if they are found out, not right. he is found right. out, that they are both involved, they're both complicit, uh, but yet they're, the woman is at a disadvantage. So it's important to, to understand that as well. But but you're, you're right, there is there is a kind of a, an arrangement, a, a way of working things where there is a choice in the matter. The father uh, can also, you know, ha- has a say in this matter uh, and would obviously consult with his daughter to see if this would be an arrangement that would be, uh, you know, suitable to her or not. That's right. And and the Bible actually does address forcible rape um, mm-hmm. in, in different contexts. And, and am I right in saying that was punishable by death, right? Wasn't... Yeah. Yeah. That would be the maximum penalty maximum. Uh, for sure. You know, uh, that uh, this would be certainly the case in, you know, say Exodus 22, uh, where it unpacks this, that series of three. Uh, you know, and again, I, I, I just to add this, I do make some modifications on the capital punishment question uh, from my Moral Monster book. I do modify it a little bit because there is a degree of hyperbole that is going on here, that burning, stoning, and so forth. These are ways of arresting people uh, and seeing this is bad, don't do it. But when you actually look at the, say, the history, and I talk about adultery, say, in the Law of Moses, as well as beyond, uh, what you see is when adultery is committed, they don't go immediately to court and, and, and the two are put to death. Both are held responsible, of course, but you have monetary payment that there is there there has been damage done, and so the uh, the uh, the innocent party is to be paid monetarily. It's to be resolved there. I mean, it's potentially it could be capitally punishable, but generally speaking, these things were resolved more privately and in house, as it were, and monetary payment was given. And so I go into more detail on that. But uh, yes, there are a few a couple of kind of exemplary cases of blasphemy and and Sabbath breaking, where that is punished by death. But generally speaking, both in the ancient Near East and the surrounding nations, as well as in Israel, uh, a lot of these severe penalties were assumed to be uh, you know, figurative, were assumed to be symbolic, but were, were meant to send a severe warning to people. Uh, so that was how they're typically taken in the ancient Near East. And I go into more detail on that in the Vindictive Bully Book. Okay, so people can be reading along through the Old Testament, you know, Elisha's walking around, and then all of a sudden you have something that's like, wow, like that sounds really bizarre. And again, this, I really wanted to bring this one up with you because this is something you see uh, on TikTok all the time. And by the way, I don't recommend people go on TikTok. I was doing that for research. I'm really glad I'm not doing that research anymore. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I'm not advocating people go on TikTok, but you just, you know, that this is where deconstruction is largely happening is TikTok, Instagram, different social media platforms. And the Elisha and the two bears story just gets a lot of airtime in the deconstruction movement. So I'm going to read that for the sake of our listeners and then uh, let you comment on it because there is... uh, there, there's a lot going on in this passage that may not be clearly evident to our modern minds right off the bat. So this is from Second Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and it says, Then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up by the way, young lads came out from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. When he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads of their number. Twenty, uh, And then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. So um, often on TikTok, it said, hey, you know, uh, a bunch of little kids— you know, little baby kids came up to Elisha and made fun of his bald head, and then God had them torn apart and mauled to death. So is that is that what was going on? Well, <clears throat> it's a lot of times this is portrayed as though these are kid, like kids on the playground and they're, they're right. teasing the, the prophet. And so this is a cranky old prophet. And Greg Boyd would say, well, Elisha is misusing 
the power that God has given to him. It's uh, it's called he calls it semi autonomous power. And so the power that God gives to prophets and apostles for good, they can misuse that power uh, for, you know, again, for fallen for their own fallen purposes. Well, it's helpful to step back and see what the broader context is. One, these are not little little kids, you know, five, six years old on the playground, uh, teasing a prophet or mocking him. Uh, these are young, unmarried men who are of marriageable age, but just don't have households of their own. Uh, for example, uh, the same term is used for uh, Solomon, same term is used for David uh, before he's about to fight against Goliath. So uh, someone who can handle his own, who's, uh, who, who's very responsible, uh, knows what's going on. Secondly, you also have mention in, in, in Leviticus 26, there are blessings and curses that come with the obedience uh, to the law or disobedience uh, against the law. And if you disobey the law, God says, I will send wild animals and you will be bereft of your children. So God is warning against that. If you're going to follow after, you know, do and commit idolatrous practices, these are the consequences. God has sent his warning. Well, what happens? Well, in of course, we know about uh, Elijah, Elijah going up in chapter one of Second Kings. He he's gone up, uh, go on up, uh, where we get that go on up, Baldy. Uh, also, Elijah was a hairy man. Uh, apparently, Elisha was not as hairy, so he looked bald by comparison. And you also have. Elisha, who has just gone to Jericho, where they had the contaminated waters, and through Elisha's intervention, he made the waters drinkable again. And it says the land had become had been unfruitful. That's that's the same word that is used for bereft. The land had been bereft hmm. of fruit. Same word that's used from Leviticus 26. Well, you get to Bethel, which is a center, a hotbed of idolatry. You have these young men who are probably part of the royal house and the priestly house, uh, a combination uh, that, that they know better. They are, they are young adults and they are mocking him because they are idolaters and they, someone who is in tune with the covenant of Moses and bringing uh, his message to them, they, rather than receiving him as a prophet of God, they mock him. And so these 42 youths, they are, are mauled because this is exactly what God said would happen. You will, you know, you know, God will send wild beasts and you will be bereft of, their, of your children. So this has been promised by God. It's part of a covenant violation. And so these are the sorts of things that are to be expected when people go astray from God's commands and disobey him. So it's, it's not a cranky prophet who's being called baldy. Uh, it is someone who is using the power of God in keeping with the covenant of God that the curses will come if you do these sorts of things. So mm -hmm. that's the basic gist. I say more about it than that, but, uh, but wanted to give just a, a broad overview of what's going on there. Yeah, and I think stories like that are meant to, I think, make us from this side of the cross really appreciate the grace that mm. we that has been offered to us, unmerited mm. favor. We don't deserve God's grace and mercy, yet he gives it anyway. And uh, mm. I'm going to let you kind of close us out with maybe some advice for people who, you know, one of the things we're seeing, statistical data being released that a lot of Christians are not biblically literate. So they might, right. in fact, I, I was just speaking at a conference yesterday where a young lady uh, just basically raised her hand and said, um, many of my friends, even in church, we don't really read the Bible. We just kind of get our Bible from social media and, you know, videos people make about the Bible and things like that. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's curious to me the way some people approach the Old Testament, and here would be my advice, and then I'll throw it over to you. Mm -hmm. Don't approach the Bible trying to make God fit into the way that you think God would be if you invented mm -hmm. God. Go yeah. to the Bible to learn about who God really is, which is going to be different than probably what you would think of, because you're way less perfect than God. You're not as smart. You can't see the, the future. You're not as wise. You're not as intelligent. So we, we need to go to Scripture and get our information information about who God is from there, not the other way around. What advice would you give to people watching about how to approach reading the Bible? Yeah. Well, don't, uh, I'd say uh, if you are 
wanting to understand who God is, don't go to a short TikTok video. That's right. Uh, um, so, so <laughs> avoid, you know, go to the source. And I think that, it, you know, and I think that this requires some patience, but I think that there are ways in which we can approach these questions. Uh, that when people say, well, what about, you know, Elisha and the bears? Well, you know, do you know that God actually warned against this, that if, mm-hmm. you know, that, that God would actually do just what happened if people violated this? Do you know that they actually weren't young, you know, little little children, uh, but they were knowledgeable, uh, res- morally responsible adults? Uh, you know, so it's, it's helpful to ask that. Also, I think it's helpful to remember, too, that secondly, when God sends judgment, it's not as though he delights in this. Some people think that God, you know, that vindictive bully picture, that God delights in this, that God uh, wants to throw his weight around. You read in the, uh, you know, in, in Genesis chapter six, that God is grieved about having to send judgment, that God is reluctant to do so. Uh, Lamentations 3, that God does not afflict willingly. God is often doing these sorts of things as a last resort. Finally, God says, okay, I've had enough. You know, he, you know, the Canaanites, some people say, well, what if God commanded the Canaanite thing in our day? Well, let's wait maybe 500 years or so and see what happens. But I, I'm not, I'm just being a little playful there. I'm not saying this is repeatable. It's a unique event. But God waited over 500 That's years right. until the sin of the Amorites was filled up. He waited until the time was right, until the sin had fully ripened to bring judgment. It would have been wrong and precipitous for the Israelites to do something earlier than that time. So, so God is grieved at this. It's also helpful to remember that when God is, you know, when we talk about his his, the, you know, and I talk about this passage too from from Exodus twenty that the uh, the blessing that comes to a thousand generations, so, you know, again a, a full uh, you know full measure of blessing comes to those who trust in the covenant, but yet the the three or four generations actually within a basically a lifetime, you know, that God is though against those who hate me, God brings judgment against those who resist His covenant. But again, you see the picture of this large measure of grace that is being presented, and the small measure of judgment that is being meted out. You, you see this picture of generosity of spirit that God is He wants to bless, He desires to bless, but yet you know and is reluctant to bring judgment, but He will do so if He has to. But again, He wants to keep it limited. Uh, so there are those sorts of pictures that we see in the Old Testament. And it's helpful to remember, too, that Jesus, who whom so many see as the, the moral paradigm, the one who presents to us a very believable picture of a uh, mo- sound, you know, morally, mentally, emotionally sound human being who makes very good judgments. He is one who talks about wrath. He promises that there will be judgment falling upon the nation of Israel. He curses a fig tree uh, as representative of the curse that is going to be coming upon the Israelites for uh, turning away from the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. Uh, we see this carried on that that finally, you know, when when people do all sorts of terrible things, well, God can't but judge them. And, and I think that when we see the, the bigger heart of God, and, and I think that when Greg Boyd is talking about seeing that God is loving his enemies, of course, we want to emphasize that. And Jesus is indeed representing the, the heart of God. Uh, when you know Jesus says, the one who has seen me has seen the Father. But uh, too often, this is uh, presented in an imbalanced way that it's only love turning the other cheek, and wrath seems to be diminished. Severity is 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 nowhere in sight, and 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 so it's it's important for us to remember that when God brings judgment, it is reluct it is out of reluctance, and this judgment may actually f- reflect the divine heart of concern and love that God has for others. In, in John three, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. But we see later on in chapter three that for those who resist God, the wrath of God remains on them. We have love, we have wrath. These are not pitted against each other. And I think we just need to uh, press people to see, to have a better understanding of how wrath and love fit together and that these can be found within not just, quote, the God of the Old Testament, but the one who reveals that God of the Old Testament, who is engaged in the Old Testament events himself, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, who displays the kindness and the severity of God, the one who is one who will not crush a uh, bruised reed, he will not snuff out a smoldering wick, but he's also one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron.
Very good. Well, I want to thank my guest, Dr. Paul Copan. If you're not familiar with his work, he has uh, written or edited lots of different books. He's featured in the Comprehensive Guide to Apologetics. Of course, the book we talked about today is God a Vindictive Bully, is God a Moral Monster, the companion previous uh, to that one. And then also, uh, he co-wrote a book with Matthew Flanagan called Did God Really Command Genocide? All About the Canaanite Conquest that we barely got to touch on today. So uh, definitely pick up some of those resources if that would be helpful to you. Thank you so much for watching today. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video because we have some great conversations coming up for you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Unshaken Faith podcast for quick little 15-minute episodes each week about hot-button cultural topics. Also, share this on social media. It really helps with the algorithms. If you if you see this post somewhere, to like it, to leave a little comment, uh, to share it with your friends in any way you, you can, that would be so helpful. If you want access to bonus content and early access to podcasts, you can go to patreon.com slash Alisa Childers. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.